a uh, very good evening to all of you and uh, for mccoy it would be a very good morning he is addressing us from the united states the united states which will be uh, very shortly into one of the finest election process we always are a big fan of the election process uh, one of the best electoral system that you know the united states has we never miss any debate between joe biden and uh, donald trump yes today that's not the topic that we are here all right so i welcome uh, professor mccoy on behalf of the drisha group of institution on behalf of my chairman ca gopal krishna but i extend a warm welcome to you and thank you so much for being here with us today despite of the busy schedule over there and to address on a very very apt topic a very unique topic the reason uh, we decided to go for this is one is our chairman always believes to have you know something really very unique and something really very different uh, which is above the four walls of the classroom or which is about the the curriculum you know and today as a students i think probably they should have the moral responsibility to getting all the updates which is happening around the world and a lot of people talk about uh, north korea but then i am very sure they're not completely aware about it and we have uh, we are really a very privileged and honored to have a resource person like you who have done immense study you know on the uh, north korea and i thought there cannot be any better person than professor robert mccoy who's a renowned geopolitical analyst and a fellow from montana university from the united states so before i hand over to professor mccoy this is your first interaction with us so i request uh, ca gopal krishna but the founder of this institution to give a quick overview about the institutions what we are and what we are and and our vision also over to you sir this is a mccoy sir uh, it is a nice uh, meeting through the through this platform Uh, i think trisha uh, whereas uh, started way back in 98 it is more than two decades and uh, we have been catering to the students of commerce and finance we have our own set of colleges in karnataka bengaluru udupi and mangalore and we have a coaching center basically predominantly into the field of chartered accountancy and company secretary this is what about the, the just brief but i always believe the student should have a varied knowledge so that they are become equipped and better equipped and knowledgeable and informed persons in this direction i always discuss with my good friend as well as the principal young dynamic principal mr guru prasad rao then uh, he told about you and we are very happy to talk to you to understand what about the hidden facts about north korea how it is articulated is it true is not true what should be the all those are the issues and uh, i think uh, uh, i always believe when you exchange information it is always a gain uh, when you have money you given and you will remain with the same but if you have knowledge exchanged i think students and you know public in general will get more information uh, that's what i always say finally the student has to be more humble should be a better person should be a valuable citizens of our nation in this direction i think the very experienced person and giving a nice experience about the various facts will give us lot of uh, insights and ideas it is not just about information it's more of insights that's what we are looking with that uh, short notice a short notice uh, you have come here and uh, we welcome you sir on this program and it is a nice meeting you in this platform we keep exchange resources and ideas i think guru sir will be able to coordinate better and uh, thank you guru sir bringing uh, mccoy on this platform to understand various other aspects and how uh, us will look into this perspective in the time of election and uh, very uh, especially today it is among the various uh, uh, days of dasara today is considered more auspicious and we all celebrated or we have performed the saraswati puja saraswati is the, uh, the goddess of knowledge and jnana i think any knowledge or jnana we get from anywhere in the world we welcome with that note uh, welcome you sir on this uh, special occasion special auspicious day over to melkai sir uh, the ceo gopal krishna but for that wonderful overview and uh, welcoming professor mccoy uh, professor mccoy as we all believe that it's an honor and privilege to have you amongst us uh, on personal note uh, jim uh, on king uh, you know the our jim on king uh, the, the 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 founder or the the person who is part of the uh, uh north korea has always been one of my favorites i do follow him a lot but there are a lot of rumors that is been spreading around so i thought this is a very nice platform for us to understand more about it as mentioned by uh, gopal krishna but yes sir so without wasting much time uh, i request professor mccoy to share his views on the lesser known facts of the north korea over to you sir 
very much. I appreciate the honor and, and privilege of addressing uh, you and your students, uh, your CA person there. Uh, you have a very fine institution and I feel very humble that you've reached out to me. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I would like to begin by explaining that North Korea has been a part of my life since 1962. And I've been paying attention to uh, North Korea and, and how it's behaved and how it doesn't behave uh, for almost 60 years now. So I have a bit of experience, I don't mean to brag, but I do bring a rather unique perspective to uh, the uh, observation and commentary about North Korea because I've been involved in it for such a long period of time. Um, what I would like to do is give you a very quick overview of what I plan to discuss. I'd like to start with how North Korea came into existence, how it came to be, and then I will move quickly into uh, current relations between the major players, South Korea, uh, China, the United States, uh, and how they interact with North Korea. And then I will move on to how uh, we're currently negotiating with North Korea. Uh, and I will end up, with your permission, with a brief discussion on how uh, commercial activities with North Korea will probably play out in the future. So without further ado, uh, I should mention I'm quite willing to uh, handle uh, questions at the very end, unless it's a critical nature. Uh, so shall we begin? I will start by sharing my screen. The story of North Korea actually goes back to the spring of 1945 when uh, Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the United States president at the time, met at the uh, Yalta Resort in the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea. Uh, this was between the 4th and the 11th of February, 1945. During that meeting, they discussed uh, how they would wind up handling the war in Asia. The war in Europe was about to be over. Uh, in fact, defeat of Germany was on the 8th of May, 1945. Uh, the war in Asia continued for several months after that. President Roosevelt realized that uh, getting Japan to surrender would require a much more assistance than what the United States would be able to offer by itself. And he enlisted Joseph Stalin's support in that. Stalin agreed to attack Japan 90 days after uh, the defeat of Europe. And in fact, that's how it turned out. Uh, Stalin was willing to do this despite having suffered tremendous losses uh, in fighting off Germany on the Western Front because he wished to avenge the Russian defeat, the Soviet, the Russian defeat uh, in the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. So he agreed to within three months attack uh, Japan after the defeat of Europe. Well, as the war in Europe came to a close, the United States was caught really off guard. We had no intelligence of, as to the Japanese activities on the Korean Peninsula that we have, we see here. Totally off guard. We had no intelligence as to what the uh, Russians were doing. They declared war two days after the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima and one day before we dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki on the 9th. Uh, so the Soviet Union at that time declared war on the 8th of August. And at that time, we had no idea what was going on. So two very young officers in the United States Army one by the name of Dean Rusk, who later became Secretary of State under John F. Kennedy and then later Lyndon Johnson as when they were President of the United States, and another uh, Army officer by the name of Charles Bonnestell III. Those two were given the task of finding a place, finding a dividing line to divvy up North Korea. We already knew that we were going to allow the Soviet Union to have many of its lost islands back uh, to becoming Soviet property. We'll get to that in just a moment. But these two individuals, the United States Army, Rusk and Bonnestell, were given a 1940s uh, 
vintage map of Korea. And you will see, if you can blow this up on your screen, uh, that these place names are in Japanese. They're not in Korean. Japan had occupied the Korean Peninsula since 1910. And at that time, toward the end of the war particularly, they discouraged, uh, in fact, took several distinct measures to wipe out the Korean culture, wipe out the Korean language, and wipe out uh, Korean names. Hence, this map published by the National Geographic Society in the early 1940s reflects Japanese names. Well, the two army officers took a look at the map and realized that the 38th parallel right here, where my cursor is showing, is roughly halfway uh, uh, dividing line of the peninsula. And they chose that line. So anything south of this, whoops, I need to get back to that. Anything south of that line became under Western control. Anything north of this line became under Soviet control, part of the spoils of war. What we did not realize at the time is that the Japanese had the Soviets bottled up in the extreme northeast corner here. The United States could have drawn a line here or here. I keep clicking, I don't need to do that. Here, we could have kept the Soviets bottled up in this part of the, the country. And much of Korea, had we, do, had we done that, would have been free and would be uh, under the control of South Korea. But we didn't have the intelligence and so we did that. Well, after the war, uh, the Soviets rebuilt North Korea. The Americans did not attempt to rebuild South Korea. In fact, most of the resources were diverted to Japan because uh, at the time the thinkers in American foreign policy realized that Japan was going to be needed as a bulwark against communism in the Far East. And Korea was more or less just sacrificed. In fact, General Hodge, who was delegated by uh, General MacArthur to oversee uh, the uh, occupation of South Korea, as he was disembarking from his boat to take occupation of South Korea in early October, uh, told his staff that the Koreans were the enemy. He obviously could not distinguish between the Koreans as an occupied country under Japan and Korean and the Japanese as the imperialist uh, colonialist occupiers. So that was a mistake. There was another mistake that the Americans made as well. And that is because of a lack of uh, expertise, they kept Japanese administrators in charge. It would be like freeing the slaves in the Americas uh, after the Civil War in the United States and keeping plantation owners in charge of the American blacks. It simply was a very horrible mistake. During that time, between 1945 and 1950, when the Korean War started, there were several border incidences along the uh, line here, as I show you, the 38th parallel. Uh, the South would probe, seeing what the weaknesses of the North uh, would be. And the North would probe uh, incursions, seeing what the weaknesses of the South would be. Both sides were very much at fault of this. They were very small skirmishes, but they were nonetheless bloody and deadly. Uh, the United States had installed uh, Syngman Rhee as the president of South Korea, but Syngman Rhee wanted to press north and reunite the country, the peninsula, under his rule, the southern rule, with the support of the United States. And because of that, the United States didn't want another land war. They had, we had just finished four years of very bloody combat of World War II. We did not want to get involved in another war. We kept South Korea militarily weak, even though at the same time we were telling them that they were very well trained and very well equipped. That is not the case. The Soviets, on the other hand, were busily rebuilding North Korea and equipping it quite well. <clears throat> At that time, uh, they installed, in 1948, uh, 47, 48, they installed the grandfather of the current uh, North Korean ruler. The grandfather, Kim Il-sung, became the first dictator of North Korea. 
under Soviet auspices, and he was quite well equipped. Uh, he also wanted to reunite the peninsula, but under northern control, communist control. And he petitioned uh, Joseph Stalin several times in the late 49 and early 1950, begging for permission to attack South Korea and reunite. <clears throat> Stalin at first was not receptive to the idea at all, but at the same time, Stalin was busily engaging in consolidating his uh, victories in Eastern Europe, establishing his countries, his satellite countries behind the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe. And he was feeling the pressure from the West, the United States and the free Western Europe's powers. He finally realized that a war in Asia would be a good diversion it would also be a chance for him to test Western resolve in its fight against communism. He finally, Stalin finally told a North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung, if you can get Mao Zedong, the leader of China, communist China, to promise support if you were to need it, then I will give you the okay to attack South Korea. After several meetings with Mao, Mao agreed and the die was cast, as they say in Julius Caesar, uh, and the plans were made. In the meantime, the United States had withdrawn its troops uh, from South Korea. We were down to perhaps 500 uh, total, most of those in advisory capacities, officers, certainly not men under arms. On the 25th of June, at around four o'clock in the morning, just about dawn, on a Sunday. Uh, Sunday was chosen because the previous Saturday night, the United States Embassy had thrown a big party uh, in Seoul. Seoul is the capital of South Korea. It's located right about there. And people were late getting to bed. They were probably uh, deprived of sleep. Many of them were probably hung over from having ingested too much alcohol when the North Koreans attacked. And Everything was, it was just chaos. We were totally unprepared and the North Koreans smashed through defenses, came down and pushed American forces and those <clears throat> ill-equipped and uh, undertrained South Koreans down to what we call the Pusan perimeter. This little area here between the coast and here, the Pusan perimeter, city of Pusan is right here. And we were, trying to wait for re reinforcements from both Japan, this is the southern island of Japan, and from the United States as well. <clears throat> In the meantime, while we were retreating, uh, Seoul was taken over by the North Koreans, and we all fell back to the Pusan perimeter of this area here. At the same time, President Harry Truman, who had assumed the presidency uh, after uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had died on the 12th of April, <clears throat> excuse me, went to the United Nations seeking support and additional uh, uh, troops to help fight the communists back north of the 38th parallel. An interesting side story is that uh, Joseph Stalin, of course, was aware of this because it was public knowledge in the United States that this is exactly what Harry Truman was doing. It was on the floor of the General Assembly this could have been vetoed at the Security Council by the Soviet Union if the Soviet Union had attended. But because Stalin wanted a proxy war between the communist countries and the West, he ordered his representative at the United Nations uh, to absent himself, to not attend the UN meetings. And therefore, the resolution to engage North Korea in the Korean Peninsula uh, was passed and the United States was not allowed, I would say it would be a better choice of words to say we were sucked in to the war. Uh, this is exactly what Joseph Stalin had wanted and we were in the war. So to assist in getting out of this Pusan perimeter where we were somewhat trapped, MacArthur did the Incheon landing that your students are probably aware of, landing here, cut the North Korean supply lines here and we were able to push back to roughly the 38th parallel. So Seoul had changed hands once to the communists, back to the Westerners and South Koreans, that's two times. And 
right about there. At this time, Joseph, uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur was pestering uh, President Truman to reunite the country. We have a golden opportunity. We have pushed the North Koreans north of the 38th. We're roughly here. Let's continue north and reunite the country under Western rule. And Truman at first was not willing to do that. We had accomplished the mission of gaining back the uh, status quo ante. Eventually, MacArthur prevailed and Truman gave the go ahead. So we had troops going all the way up north. And at the same time, communist China, who was right here over in this area here, uh, was saying, look, you don't want to approach our borders because if you do, we are going to react. You won't like that. Um, the United States did not pay attention to that. And in October, while we had at two places here in this general area and here in this general area, we had American troops sitting on mountain ridges overlooking the floodplains of the Yalu River, which is this river here, the border between uh, Korea and China. Chinese troops came in in the middle of October 1950 and we finally engaged them. They finally engaged us actually. And once again, the massive troops, the Chinese hordes pushed American troops back, further back down, once again, past the 38th parallel, past Seoul. Seoul was lost a third time. And in fact, we had a second Pusan perimeter in this general area here. We did not get pushed as far back because we were more prepared, but we did have to fight our way back. And then we wound up along what is the current DMZ today. We were there for about two years fighting back and forth. American troops would make a push here, for example, and we would get pushed back. Ch uh, Chinese and North Korean troops would make a push here, for example, and they would get pushed back. The border between 1951 and 1953 remained relatively constant. And the reason that we endured two years of this stalemate is that Joseph Stalin had instructed the North Korean and Soviet negotiators to delay. Stalin realized that the United States would be weakened both politically and militarily the longer the conflict went on. And they argued about such mundane things as the shape of the negotiating table, where people would sit, so forth. Finally, when Mao realized that things were not going to improve, Stalin was able to be convinced to sign the armistice. But interestingly, the armistice is, did not involve South Korea. The United States signed on their behalf, on behalf of the United Nations. So during this time, Japan enjoyed a great deal of, uh, let me go back to this, let me go to this map here. Japan was used, the western part of Japan here was used as a stepping off point for many American forces. And at the time, we really poured a lot of money into improving the infrastructure of Japan. They were able to rebuild much faster than North Korea was after the war. And worse, during the war, the American Air Force had made uh, so many bombing runs that all throughout the North Korean and South Korean peninsula, uh, everything was reduced to rubble. North Korea was a broken, or South Korea too, the Korean peninsula in its entirety was a broken piece of geography. Japan, however, was being groomed to be the bulwark, bulwark against Soviet and communist Chinese uh, expansion in the Soviet Union, in, in the Far East. So let me check my notes here to make sure that I'm on track. OK, let's move forward a little bit. North Korea has been working on at atomic weapons for more than a decade, close to two decades. And you can see that their first blast was a very small one. It was less than uh, the bomb that hit either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. The second blast, 2006 was the first, 
the next one was 2009. It wasn't much bigger, still much smaller than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The third one in 2013 was still rather small, six to nine kilotons. The one in 2016 was seven to 10 kilotons, still smaller than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima or the one dropped on Nagasaki. However, the one in 2016, 10 kilotons, a firm 10 kilotons at the minimum. Now we're approaching the range of what the United States had in 1945. But this one in 2017, 20, in September, they had really improved their nuclear technology. 140 kilotons, that's huge compared to the others. And it gave a lot of Western analysts a great deal of thought. This is much greater than a purely atomic bomb could achieve. Is it a, a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear weapon, or is it merely a hydrogen boosted weapon? Without getting into the technology or the technical terms of this, uh, it really doesn't make much difference because a weapon that has 140 kilotons uh, equivalent of uh, TNT is a weapon to be feared, certainly. In addition to this, at the same time, a different group of scientists were working on missiles, the ability to deliver uh, that weapon. And you can see that in later uh, 2017, North Korea had developed a, a rocket, a missile, an intercontinental ballistic missile called the Hwasong-15 that can travel this distance. It can reach all of the United States, all of Canada, all of Alaska, uh, including Guam and right there, and certainly Okinawa, where we have most of our forces in Asia and all of Japan. So this got people's attention. And it's interesting to note that in 2003, North Korea had bailed out of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty uh, that was 17 years ago. We should have been paying attention to that because if we go back to take a look at this, it was only three years later in 2006 that they detonated their first device. That should have been the tip off point. Now we have been engaged in negotiations uh, for both the nuclear weapons and the missiles uh, since 1994 but we haven't gotten anywhere for a number of reasons. First of all, the United States is woefully ignorant about all of Asia. Well, that includes your country, as well as the countries in which the United States has chosen to focus recently. <clears throat> Even though most of our negotiations are just, uh, conducted in English, we do not use our own language to our own advantage. Uh, the North Koreans, for example, will tell us such things as, well, yes, we will denuclearize, and we blindly believe that as a, a fact. What the, what the North Koreans might mean is we will denuclearize this particular uh, installation. We will no, no longer use this installation in the making of nuclear bombs. The United States hasn't realized that. Uh, the North Koreans use language much, much better than uh, we do. They are also getting assistance from Pakistan at the time. Uh, AQ Khan assisted them. Uh, as I said, they bailed out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2003. Three years later, they've got the bomb. We began uh, six party talks later that year, 2003, because finally China decided if North Korea were to continue, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of unrest, political and social unrest in the Korean Peninsula, and China realized it would be in their own best interests to uh, host the six party talks. Those six parties were Russia, here, China, North and South Korea, that's four, Japan is five, and the United States six. They met and for years, uh, nothing happened. Finally, uh, in 2009, North Korea launched a satellite and as people that are familiar with rockets understand, any country that can launch a satellite into orbit concurrently has developed the 
a technology and the wherewithal to throw a nuclear bomb practically anywhere else in the world. If you can push it up high enough to be a satellite, you can push it far enough along uh, to get to other countries and threaten them that way. So after North Korea launched that satellite, they left the talks and the 20 or the 1994 uh, agreed framework was a dead deal. President Obama thought he had a nego negotiated a plan in 2012 called the leap year day or the leap day deal. But within a, just a matter of a few weeks, North Korea threatened to launch another satellite and that deal died. So we haven't been very successful in dealing with the North Koreans. Uh, we don't do a good job of understanding their point of view. We, for example, go to them and say, well, we can introduce you to uh, Western technology. Well, they've got the bomb, they've got missiles, uh, they've done quite well without Western technology. Uh, we say things like, well, we can introduce you to capitalism. Well, North Korea is not interested in capitalism uh, per se. The ruling elites uh, don't have any motivation. Kim Jong-un, the current leader, the grandson of the founder of North Korea, uh, has been able to get past all of the sanctions that we've imposed, both the United Nations sanctions and those imposed unilaterally by the United States and others. So there simply isn't a motivation to do that. Now, let me see here. I want to see where I am. China, the reason that China is very concerned is because of this. This is China, the gray area here, and China goes off to uh, the left here on your screen. Here's North Korea. During the Japanese occupation from 1910 to 1945, and actually going way back in history, a great number, perhaps as many as 2 million uh, Korean nationals fled their own country to this area here highlighted in the golden ochre color. And they remain there today. They are Chinese citizens, according to the uh, Beijing, the communist China, but they maintain uh, the older ones, certainly uh, the younger ones to a lesser degree, uh, the Korean language and the Korean customs. And China is concerned that if something should happen in North Korea that would cause either internal unrest or if North Korea were to anger the United States and the other allies uh, that North Korea were attacked, then there would be a great refugee problem flowing from North Korea into these areas here. They're also concerned about the loyalty of these uh, Chinese Koreans here. Do they have loyalty to China or do they have loyalty to North Korea? How would they react? China is very concerned about that. And that was the motivation behind uh, starting the six party talks. Things have settled down a little bit, but they have not been solved. China also wants a buffer. They don't want North Korea to go away. They are very happy to have North Korea exactly where it is, no matter what it costs them to do, to keep them that way, because China does not want the capitalistic South Korea, as you see here, uh, up along its borders. If North Korea were to implode, to die, to be overthrown, and somehow become united with South Korea, or become a capitalistic nature, a nation of its own, then that capitalistic and democratic process would be right along the borders of China's three uh, northern easternmost provinces. And that's something that China does not want. It would increase the civil unrest in these three relatively backward uh, provinces. These three provinces don't get the attention uh, of China, Beijing, that the other provinces do. But nonetheless, they're still aware that they want North Korea as a buffer between it and South Korea. So for that reason, they are supportive of North Korea. They give North Korea, perhaps 90% of North Korean's foreign trade is with China across the Yalu River, uh, Dongdong, the Chinese city, and Sinuiju, the Korean city, in this area right here. <clears throat> Well, we have South Korea, 
But South Korea is a bit confused at the moment. The South Korean president is Moon Jae-in. His parents fled the North in this area here during the Korean War. They settled in South Korea and Moon studied his liberal politi political views under a previous uh, South Korean president, uh, Ro Myu Hyun. And that was perhaps as much as 30 years ago. But so we have uh, the current president, South Korea Moon, has family ties to North Korea. He is a liberal politician. He believes that all we need to do is talk with Pyongyang and give them aid, engage them in financial projects and geopolitical assistance, and things will be fine. Uh, my read of having studied North Korea since 1962 is that is not going to happen. Uh, President Moon of South Korea fails to understand the North just as the United States fails to understand the North. Uh, and I will get to that in a, a little bit. I will discuss in great detail uh, the motivations that Kim has for staying exactly as he is. But I also want to talk about a little bit of the relations between North Korea and the United States. They have never been good. At times they have been relatively calm. I say relatively uh, because there's always been tension along the border here, the, the demilitarized zone. But in 1965, two ev uh, events happened uh, that set the stage for something that historians call the Second Korean War period. That is not to say that there was outright conflict in the sense of a shooting war, but they say that the Second Korean War uh, period began in 1966. Like a lot of historians, they're wrong. And I can say that with firm belief because I was there. I was flying reconnaissance missions out of uh, Yokota Air Base, Japan, just northwest of Tokyo. We'd fly over and do reconnaissance missions in these areas here. And I know exactly what was happening. The second Korean War period happened in 1965. In April of 1965, an RB-47, a B-47 is a six jet engine bomber that was converted to reconnaissance. That's why it's called an RB, R for reconnaissance. It flew out of uh, Yokota Air Base, Japan, and was flying in international waters off the coast of North Korea. Now, an interesting point here, international law says your coastal waters go out to 12 miles, 12 nautical miles. That's approximately 18, 19 kilometers. Uh, but North Korea doesn't accept that. They say it's too close. They claim 50 nautical miles, which puts it out about like this. Even so, the RB-47 was flying in international waters when two aircraft, fighter aircraft from North Korea came out and shot it up, ambushed it. Uh, it was shot up so badly that it needed to be refueled twice before it could return to its base at Nakoda in, in uh, Japan. And once it was able to land due to superior airmanship, uh, I'm surprised that the thing was didn't crash land, but it landed. Uh, the plane was so badly damaged that they decided to use it for parts and that airframe never flew again. That's the first incident. That happened in early uh, April, 1965. Another incident in later April, 1965, I was flying in a reconnaissance mission um, in a different aircraft in this area here, also well into international waters. When North Korea sent out two MiG-21s, sorry, not MiG-21s, MiG-17s to shoot us down, we knew that and we were 90 seconds from death. We were able to duck into clouds and avoid them. So I have personal experience that the Second Korean War era did not begin in 66, as historians claim. It began in April of 1965. Well, let's jump ahead three years for some concrete examples uh, that everybody is probably aware of. The first is the USS Pueblo. The Pueblo, as shown here, was tasked by the United States Navy into doing reconnaissance 13 nautical miles off the coast of North Korea. As we explained earlier, as I explained earlier, North Korea does not accept that 12 nautical mile limit. They demand 50 nautical miles out 
in this direction. Nonetheless, the United States Navy felt that no small country like North Korea, Korea would dare board a United States naval vessel in international waters. The Navy was wrong. And in fact, we knew they would be wrong because the Navy had a lack of good Korean linguists. I was one at the time. They sent a message to my unit at Yokota asking if they could borrow some of our linguists there to be on board the Pueblo. And we told them most decidedly no. And we warned them what would happen. After two days of playing around in the area, North Korea had enough and they seized the boat. When they did, the Americans did not know what to do. Our American fighters and the South Korean fighters uh, were totally unprepared. We had strip alert fighters. Those strip alert means fighters that are prepared for war. They're standing, uh, aircraft are fueled up, uh, they're hooked to a, a starting engine cart, and all they need to be is uh, have their engine started, the, the pilot jump in, strap in, and they can take off and they're at war within just a couple of minutes. Uh, the Americans had their fighters equipped with tactical nuclear weapons. They were not prepared for a tactical uh, conventional situation. And they were unable to rescue the boat uh, by shooting up the, the North Korean vessels that were towing it into the Wonsan Harbor here. We had no reaction forces available. Further south in Okinawa, which is, let me get to, I don't have a map that shows Okinawa. It's, if you were to draw a triangle between here and Seoul, down to roughly this area here, the people in uh, on Okinawa quickly got word of this and they volunteered their fighters, but to fit them with wing tanks uh, so that they could traverse the, the great distance to get there, it was too late. Our uh, Pueblo was already in Wonsan Harbor. The Americans further didn't know what to do, and so they stood down all reconnaissance missions. We were not allowed to fly. We had no intelligence collection efforts in the air for four days or so. And we missed what happened because the North Koreans towed the vessel from Wonsan Harbor around Korea all the way down south and around here up to, into the mouth of the Tadong River and up to Pyongyang where it is moored on the shores of the Tadong River and is now serving as a museum in embarrassment to the United States. So that happened on the 15th of April, 1968. Sorry, the 23rd of December, 19, uh, 23rd of January, 1968, I apologize. 23rd of January, 1968, this occurred. We have another incident that people might be aware of, and that is we had an EC-121 naval reconnaissance flight that uh, I personally prepared briefing materials for and briefed them on the dangers of uh, what they were about to do. I met about six of them. I had beer with uh, three or four of them at a club, and we were talking about how dangerous it was. They too were flying in this area out here. And we told them, it's a very dangerous place to be. You are going to get attacked. And sure enough, they were. Uh, two North Korean MiGs shot them up. 31 people fell to their death. I knew six of them. This points to the fact that the United States uh, State Department and the United States military does not do a very good job of understanding uh, its, its enemies. And to that point, I will quote this article from Sun Tzu, a Chinese uh, practitioner, a strategist, a war strategist, who is alleged to have lived between these two dates, 544 and 496 before the Common Era. Sun Tzu is probably more than one person, but these are the collected uh, knowledge of him. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know not neither, if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. These words are something that the United States has yet to internalize. 
So going back to today, we have all sorts of uh, anti-American rhetoric coming out of uh, North Korea. And things blow hot, things blow cold. Uh, there are always incidents along the DMZ. Uh, many times people lose their lives. Uh, South Korean boat in this area here got shot up. Uh, 46 sailors uh, either were killed in the exchange or drowned. Something's always going on and we just don't get it. What we need to understand is that the United States poses an existential threat to North Korea. Uh, they always have. And the, the leaders there, the, the senior elites, have no reason to trust the United States. They saw what happened when Muammar Gaddafi of Libya gave up his nuclear program. Seven or eight years later, under the United Nations, but with the United States urging it on and with the United States support, Muammar Gaddafi was ejected, thrown out of office, tracked down, and killed. North Korea also was very much aware of what happened to Saddam Hussein of Iraq when he did not have nuclear weapons. He was attacked, thrown out of office, tracked down, and executed. So North Koreans realized the one way to prevent uh, the United States from attacking them is to have the ability to attack back. Now, let's also talk a little bit about what the United States is offering. Rather, let me, before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit more about what is Kim Jong-un's motivation and what has been the motivation of his father and before him, his grandfather. First of all, the most paramount thing is to keep the regime intact. Regime survival is the most important thing. And the reason for that is Kim Jong-un and his close core of cadres, senior military officials, and the senior most uh, civilian advisors live a very good life. They have all the food that they want. They have the cars that they want. They have all the women that they want. They have the power that they want. Kim Jong-un holds life and death power. He has executed at least 84 people more than his father or grandfather combined. So people stay in line. Kim also buys loyalty by giving away expensive bottles of wine, Rolex watches, Mercedes-Benz automobiles. That's why he, in part, why he needs the cash, because he needs these expensive gifts to maintain these people's loyalty to him. Now, he has this prestige of having a, such a poor country, yet has been able to develop a nuclear weapon. Moreover, they've been able to throw a satellite in the air. They have been able to develop an intercontinental ballistic missile that can deliver uh, that to the United States. So Kim has no reason to give that up. He lives the high life. He frustrates the United States and <laughs> gets great joy out of being able to thumb his nose. Uh, Professor McCoy, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you, but then I just uh, read an article about Kim Jong-un, which says uh, he was on a trip to uh, one of his favorite places and he drops for a coffee in one of the hotels and he likes the hotel so much, he likes the coffee so much, he ended up buying that hotel. I mean, this is the kind of uh, lifestyle that Kim Jong-un is leading over there. It is indeed, it is indeed. <clears throat> so he gets to frustrate the United States and thumbing your nose is doing this, if you can see what I'm saying. It's an old American way of saying, ah, nah, 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 I got you, I got you, and you can't get me. <laughs> he is able to, he keeps his people in poverty, but he's able to do that because he can blame the United States. We need to spend the money on nuclear weapons and on rockets and missiles because if we don't have them, the United States will attack us. And as soon as we get our defenses together, then we can turn our eyes to the economy. So that's what he's been promising. And now that he has the nuclear weapons and the delivery system, we will see if he makes good on that promise. But he's able in the meantime to blame the problems of the 
uh, average North Korean on the United States. Well, what about <clears throat> what about doing something about uh, his average person? People often wonder, well, why can't we, uh, let me back up a minute and introduce what we call it, the Kaesung Industrial Complex. It's not on here because it's not new and it has been uh, shuttered. But in 19, let me see, let me check my notes. 2002, under Kim Dae-jung, South Korean president, they entered into an agreement with North Korea to use North Korean cheap labor. South Korea would go to the city of Kaesong, build this tremendous industrial complex, and employ North Korean laborers. They would pay the North Koreans more than they would normally get. It would still be by far cheaper than what South Korean laborers, laborers would get. And they would produce such things as small household goods, clothing, things of that nature. Well, by 2004, the plant was in operation. It was in complex, actually, not just one plant. And something just, the vine disappeared, very good. Uh, there were 120 South Korean uh, firms that had uh, activity in the Kaesong Industrial Complex. And among them, they, they employed 54,000 North Koreans. These North Koreans were paid a very good wage by their standards, but they didn't get all of that wage. First of all, the North Koreans had to pay bribes uh, both to get the job and then to keep the job. And the North Koreans government would skim a great deal of money from their wages with the result being that the North Koreans would be lucky, the North Korean workers would be lucky to uh, get perhaps 20, sometimes 40% of their wages. And, and a lot of those wages would be in the form of vouchers that would be good only uh, at a certain company or uh, country owned, North Korean owned stores. So the North Koreans were skimming those uh, wages. Now, even so the North Koreans were better off, the ones that were employed were better off than the average North Korean. Uh, but we need to consider something and, and put this in context. 54,000 workers, if we assume that each family uh, had four members of the family, that's about uh, perhaps acceptable uh, estimate because North Koreans tend to not have large families. They can't afford them. That would be still less than 250,000 people, less than 1% of the entire population uh, benefited from this. So having had the experience of the Kaesong Industrial Complex in this area, People were thinking, well, why don't we take advantage of the North Korean laborers and benefit them? We will have uh, an industrial complex, a special economic zone here. We'll have one here, here, all these different places here. You can see the different types that they are uh, by the legend here. These were all planned by the North Koreans because North Koreans were willing to do this because it was a great source of hard cash, tremendous influx of cash, millions of dollars. Nobody took advantage of it because as the Egyptian telecom company Orozco learned to their uh, detriment, you get involved in North Korea and you cannot repatriate your money. And in fact, Orozco wound up losing the subsidiary that they had helped build in North Korea. The North Koreans took it over. So they were just unable to do that. North Koreans... Uh, simply aren't a place where one is willing to do business. So the question is, where is the foreign direct investment going to come from? Even China has not inv invested a great deal. You remember from here, this is China, this gray area. The Chinese have not decided to invest. I don't know why we're getting those marks there. Uh, my apologies for those things showing up. Nobody wants to invest in North Korea because you can't get the money back out. The Koreans are willing to take the companies in because it is a source of hard currency. But my advice is uh, I would not invest my money there and I would not advise anybody else 
to invest their money there. That concludes my presentation. So if we have time for questions, answers, I'd be certainly willing to give them a shot. Yes, uh, uh, Professor McCoy, uh, can you hear me? You're able to hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yes, thank you so much. I mean, that was a, a very uh, in-deep presentation about the North Korea. I'm, I'm very glad that you were here because none of us knew this much insight of uh, any country for that matter. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, taken from the students' behalf, uh, which I like to post a couple of them uh, with your permission, Professor McCoy. Sure. Yeah. Uh, first one. Uh, so we all believed, you know, uh, probably uh, the Kim Jong Un would have a similar end uh, compared to the what was witnessed with uh, either Saddam Hussein or, or you know, uh, Gaddafi, but it is not happening. So. Rather, a couple of years ago, uh, Donald Trump visited uh, Kim Jong Un, and uh, how would you rate this particular visit, and what kind of implication it's going to be in the future? Well, two things. You have three questions there. Number one, uh, to expect uh, Kim Jong Un to uh, come to the same fate as either Muammar Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein, I think, <laughs> is a bit unrealistic. Uh, we don't have a way to get to him. And number two. Uh, my take on the political meeting between Donald Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un was overall a good thing because we have learned from past experience that anytime North Korea is engaged in uh, discussions with the United States, uh, hostilities tend to be on the back burner. There are no uh, incidents, uh, losses of life, attacks along the DMZ, shooting up of boats, things of that nature as long as North Korea thinks they are going to get something out of it, uh, they will continue to engage in, in discussions. And uh, as long as they, they think that, things will be relatively stable on the North Korean or the, the Korean Peninsula. With regard to the future, it depends on who wins the election. Donald Trump thinks he's going to get a deal. He mm -hmm. isn't even if he gets elected again. Uh, if Joe Biden gets elected, uh, I don't think Biden will take the same approach as, well, somebody's, I don't know if you can see these uh, random markings that come up on the screen that I can. Um, Joe Biden, I think, is going to take a different approach. He is going back to the talk, 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 talk approach. Uh, that's not going to work. Correct. All right. Uh, OK, uh, there was a question on the same thing. Uh, there was one of the students is very interested to ask you, who do you think is going to finally be victorious? Because the recent exit polls about US, which showed a very close fight, 50-50. That was unbelievable. 50% for Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump. I saw a similar fight in the exit polls, uh, I remember, of uh, George Bush and Al Gore. I mean, I, after that, I couldn't see anything uh, closer like this. What's your take, Professor McCoy? Well, <laughs> you are trying to get me to commit myself. Let me say this. <laughs> That the polls we see in the United States show that Joe Biden has anywhere between a six to nine percent lead. But those polls, I think, are very, very misleading. Uh, having studied a bit of psychology and dabbled in statistics and surveys, I know that there is something that is called uh, the demand situation, uh, situational demand. There is also something that is known as uh, uh, private thoughts, but public uh, confession. It seems to me having, uh, I, I engaged in a webinar as a listener uh, two days ago to a political analyst who feels that since, well, let me back up and start it this way. When we do surveys of voters, we need to stratify the population. That is to make sure we, uh, survey a number of Democrats, a number of Republicans, a number of independents. We need to get a certain number of wealthy people, unwealthy people, uh, lower worker class people, uh, people from the North, the South, East, the West, all these different things. We have to make sure that we get a representative number from the proper segments of society. What they have found out is that over the past years, these particular segments, some segments, would tend to vote Republican. 
And yet when they're doing the surveys these days, they're finding that these people are not admitting to being pro Donald Trump. I think that's in part because they're embarrassed. Uh, there could be any number of explanations. I won't go into that. It would take a psychoanalyst to do it. The point I'm making here is that I think the polls are much, much closer than what you read in the American newspapers. I tend to not put much faith in the American news media anymore. I do a <laughs> lot of foreign uh, papers. Okay. All right. Uh, whatever it is, I really enjoy listening to the uh, debate from, you know, the people like Biden and Trump. It's always amazing to see early morning in the day, you start off seeing those debates. Anyway, sir, uh, one of the students asked you a question. What's the take on uh, North Korea by the International Human Rights Violation, uh, uh, you know, Department of United Nations or anyone for international human relations? Or, uh, you know, uh, do, you find they, do they find that, you know, to be very, very controversial? And do they have any say in the North Korea? the Human Rights Department? Well, they are very, very much on it. The last one I read was a, uh, a huge report that came out, I believe, uh, a few years ago, and they excoriated North Korea on its human rights uh, record. They're a horrible country. I think they're probably close to the bottom uh, internationally with regard to human rights. It does not make any difference, though, because, as I explained earlier, uh, Kim Jong-un does not care about the average citizen. His job is to keep him and his immediate regime alive. And they do that by having developed the, the nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. Whether or not now that they have those and, and it will make them secure enough to where they can turn a little bit of attention to taking care of the average citizen, that remains to be seen. But while they do get upset when the United States or the United Nations uh, berates them or gives them a hard time by publishing reports pointing out how bad they are. In the long run, it really doesn't make much difference. I mean, the numbers that you just put forward was something unbelievable. You mentioned about 84 people getting executed under him. Uh, those were the known ones. I'm very sure there must be unknown uh, executions, many more. You never know about it. That's true. When I say 84, I'm talking about 84 of the elites, and let's define the elites. Uh, anybody that works in, a, in the party uh, in some capacity could be uh, considered in an expanded version of, of being an elite. However, I use the term uh, to re be restricted to the top, maybe three or 4,000 uh, party members that live in uh, the capital of Pyongyang. Not everybody gets to live in Pyongyang, you have to be invited to live there. You have to be very trusted. Uh, so perhaps the, the top uh, few thousand uh, out of those, 84 have been executed. As far as local uh, party members or local bosses, I'm sure a great number of those have been executed for failing to do something. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. Uh, of course, uh, you know, taking your schedule because I had requested you for an hour. Uh, with your permission, can I take the final question, sir? Okay. Yes. Uh, there was a lot of rumors in India. I'm sure it's the same rumors over there. Uh, he's no more. The Kim Jong is no more, and the sister is going to take over the regime. So one of the student is very keen to know whether it still exists or what do you say? Well, it is the only familial uh, dictatorship in the communist world. It is true that Kim Jong-un is a very young man, so he uh, can possibly live a, a number of decades further, but he is grossly overweight. He is thought to suffer from gout. Uh, I'm surprised he isn't diabetic or have heart problems. He's a heavy smoker, so he's probably aware that at some point he is going to die before his uh, time is due. Normally, you would expect uh, a person in this day and age to live to be 70 or 80 years old. Uh, he gets excellent medical care, so you know that's not unreasonable. However, we do know that uh, the average North Korean lives 12 years less than the South Korean. The average North Korean is a few inches shorter than the average South Korean, and they're a few pounds, kilograms lighter than the average South Korean. That doesn't apply to Kim Jong-un, but he has at least one daughter, possibly another one, a son, but they're too young. 
if Kim were to live another 20, 30 years, he could groom his son to take over. Failing that, we have what's called the Pak-2 bloodline. Uh, in North Korea, along the border with China is this mountain called Mount Pak-2. Kim Il-sung, the grandfather, claims to have been born there. And it's a kind of a, oh my goodness, it, it approaches a divinical aspect. He claims this royal blood, the Mount Pak-2 bloodline. Kim's sister does have that bloodline with him. Now we do know that Kim has assassinated his uncle uh, and yes. he has assassinated his half brother. So yes. possibly the sister could be being groomed as an emergency takeover. But because she's a woman, uh, that does not go over well in a Confucian and male hierarchical society such as North Korea. It would be a stopgap measure. She would have to really, really, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see how that would be possible. The older military guys that are 50, 60, 70 years old taking orders from a woman who's possibly not even 30 yet, I, I don't see that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, those really scary facts that you mentioned about uh, only sitting here in India, we can say, God bless the people of uh, North Korea, the citizens of North Korea. They do need that help. They do need God's blessing. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, uh, Professor McCoy, that was uh, unbelievable, uh, you know, listening to the deeper insights about it. I'm very sure that many of us were not absolutely aware about even a percent about what you spoke about North Korea because uh, of the fact that, uh, you know, the information's availability is also, and we have the people like you who have done an extensive research on the North Korea and you accepted our invitation at a very short span of time and you spent, you know, uh, a good amount of time with us uh, giving your uh, ideas and thoughts about North Korea. We are ever, ever grateful to you, uh, uh, Professor McCoy, on behalf of the Trisha Group of Institutions, my chairman, C.A. Goparikrishna Bhatt, students and the entire uh, teaching fraternity of Trisha Group, I extend a big thank you to you for spending your time with us. We are ever grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk with you. Um, I request only that you send me a short email saying how many people attended uh, that yes. I can have for my records. But Thank you very much and have a good evening in India. Yeah, hey. thank you so much. I shall, I shall definitely do that. Uh, I'll send you an email. And also, I look forward to see you in the U.S. soon because my visa is getting expired for the year 2023. And I wish to make one trip and visit my well-wishers over there. I will definitely have you in the list, Professor McCoy. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Good night. Uh, I mean, I have a good day to you. It's a good night here in India. Good day to you, Professor McCoy. It was nice interacting with you. Very nice, thank you. Thank you all my students, and thank you all the faculties, and uh, I also thank uh, Chairman Gopal Krishnabad for uh, you know, being uh, the excellent uh, uh, you are here, and also for his kind words in the initial stage. I thank everyone for being here. Thank you so much, and good night, everyone.